Ah, the United States of America. Without question, one of the most powerful and wise empires the world has ever seen, right? And since it's supposedly a Christian nation under God, that makes its colossal wisdom and power twice or even three times as evident, doesn't it? Since the end of World War II and the Cold War, the United States has dominated the global stage militarily and economically. Every way you look at it, this God-ordained nation is the pinnacle of human wisdom and power. And it's obvious, isn't it? Just read the Bible. It's practically ushering in the kingdom of God. Well, actually, no. The Bible is no help in understanding any kind of domination as wisdom or power, whether it be military, economic, social, cultural, or otherwise. This video explores a core image of the Christian Bible in one key passage to see what it can tell us about such so-called human wisdom and power. It also explores some spiritual and social implications of the passage. The image is the cross and the passage is 1 Corinthians 1 through 2. 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to an early Christian community in Corinth. During Paul's time, Corinth was a thriving cosmopolitan and commercial metropolis. Within the Roman Empire, it was nearly as significant as Alexandria and Rome itself. Corinth was known within the empire for its extravagant materialistic pursuits and its culture of competition. People were constantly trying to outdo one another in their pursuit of honor and sophistication and elegance and status. Americans can easily identify with such an atmosphere because of our never-ending goal of keeping up with the Joneses. What sparks Paul's need to write to this congregation was their splintering into factions. The community had been experiencing restored relationship with God and the presence and power of God's Spirit. But they were still exhibiting a culture of competition, a culture of inclusion and exclusion. He writes to explain that a culture of exclusion is completely antithetical to what it means to be in restored relationship with God. They had been drawn to the quote-unquote power of the Spirit of the Messiah, the Christ. However, they had apparently forgotten or never fully processed that the power of God's Spirit present with them was the Spirit not of the world or of Corinth, but of a crucified Messiah. And for Paul, this changed everything about what it means to be human, what power actually is, and the nature of true wisdom. And the ways that Paul explores these themes are soaked in irony and at points even sarcasm. He says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. What in the world is Paul trying to say? One key point is that divine wisdom and power, and for Paul that means true wisdom and power, is not just further along the spectrum of so-called human wisdom and power. Divine wisdom and power is totally different than what human culture has come to mean by these terms. That's why he says God's quote-unquote foolishness and weakness are wiser and stronger than so-called human wisdom and strength. Paul's jarring, paradoxical expression is meant to separate entirely the divine and the human scale of norms. He's not just contrasting different notions of wisdom and power, but claims that God is destroying human notions of wisdom and power by showing them to be bankrupt and vacuous. He says, God will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning God will thwart. And do not deceive yourselves, if you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. How does Paul think that God is destroying the so-called wisdom and power of this world? By the cross. He says that when he first taught the Corinthians, he decided to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. How does that make any sense? How could the cross of Jesus destroy the bankrupt, vacuous human notions of wisdom and power? 
This is a hugely important question. Let's take a few minutes to explore it. Paul says that to the world, the message of the cross is weakness and foolishness. I mean, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Paul went into the Roman Empire with all its military and economic domination and proclaimed that a shamefully executed Palestinian Jewish criminal, the epitome of society's garbage, is actually the Son of God and the real Lord, and not of some empire, but of the universe. If Paul was around today, we would give him referrals to psychiatric hospitals. That message was completely nonsense, at least according to the value systems of ancient Rome and contemporary America, to their so-called wisdom and power. Ancient Rome crucified literally countless human beings, but they didn't crucify just anyone. Only those with the lowest status in society were deserving of such ignoble and dehumanizing torture and execution. It was often referred to as simply the slave punishment. Crucifixion was meant to inflict maximum degradation to body and psyche for the longest period of time possible. Its purpose was terror to keep the lowly subordinate class in their lowly subordinate place by keeping them too traumatized and terrorized to even think of insubordination or trying to alter the status quo. Victims were brutally flogged, verbally abused, and psychologically humiliated. They were stripped naked, pinned to wood in various positions, and then hoisted high in a publicly visible spot, they were left to a long and excruciatingly slow death with the gradual loss of bodily control until they died by suffocation. Their corpses were then normally left for some time on the cross to be eaten by vultures and thus denied the final moment of dignity, a burial by family or friends. It's quite easy to see why Paul could consider Christ crucified as the epitome of weakness. And obviously, only someone deserving of the label fool would wind up experiencing such a horrendous end. So how does Paul use the appalling event of Jesus' crucifixion to claim that through it, God was destroying bankrupt human notions of wisdom and power? At a crucial point in his thought, he says this, Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are being destroyed, but we speak God's wisdom, a hidden mystery, which God decreed before the ages for our glory, and which none of the rulers of this age understood, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul points his finger at the rulers of this age. Who are they? In Paul's time, it was the systems of Roman imperial power. In the contemporary world, it's whatever systems are dominating, militarily, politically, and socioeconomically whoever or whatever is ruling. The rulers of this age believe that their systems of value are built on the height of human wisdom and power. These alleged wise and powerful systems of value put supposed worthless humans who are apparently undeserving of life and who should be eliminated like the way we get rid of trash onto Roman crosses. But here's the huge problem with the rulers' claims to wisdom, power, and excellent systems of value. The quote-unquote Lord of glory, in Paul's words, meaning the light and love of God in human form, Jesus the Messiah, who advocated nothing but limitless love, ended up on one of their crosses. Paul's claim is that if the rulers of this age had any wisdom or true power, if their systems of value were not actually completely worthless, this never would have happened. The fact that Jesus ends up on a Roman cross is proof positive for Paul that their supposed wisdom, power, and superb systems of value are totally bankrupt and worse than worthless. And Paul's radical critique is not aimed simply at the Roman Empire, but the quote-unquote rulers of this age. What is at stake is something endemic to all humanity, definitely including modern world imperial, state, and structural power. In today's world, we would have to include corporations which often wield more power than modern states, or wield power through modern states. So in the context of these chapters, this is the wisdom and power of God in Jesus' cross. It is revelation. It reveals and simultaneously subverts the bankruptcy of this age's systems of value and the so-called wisdom and power they are built on. It reveals the character and activity of God, that God is willing to go to limitless lengths in self-giving love to reconcile with humanity, in truth and righteousness and justice. It reveals God's preferential option for the poor. 
God's working to subvert and flip the status quo, and God's making the supposed nobodies of the world into the heart of God's somebodies. It reveals that true wisdom and power is the limitless love of living and dying in solidarity with the excluded of the world, the abused, the exploited, the broken. The so-called wisdom of this age and its systems of value is bankrupt, worse than worthless. And more than that, it shows that the marginalized and powerless, those being crushed on the bottom of society, are actually in the direct center of God's mission of the world's redemption. Paul goes on to say, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to abolish things that are. Paul's argument makes Jesus' crucifixion one of the most powerfully subversive moments in all of human history. It says that the despised and excluded and trampled are actually creation's hope and glorious future. I think one reason for this is that the experience of exclusion, while extremely painful, in the long run generates empathy eternally. Those who know exclusion know what it feels like and know that they don't want to cause that experience for others. They have empathy. They have love. They are the future. Love is the future. Now faith, hope, and love remain these three, and the greatest of these is love. Let all that you do be done in love. Love never ends. To fully appreciate the significance of this theology for the spiritual and social realities of today's world, it is necessary to not only analyze the Bible and ancient societies, it's necessary to analyze our own contexts and societal structures and practices in the contemporary world. Why are there so many poor in today's America and other rich nations? Why are people excluded from the necessary resources to have a flourishing life and time to relax and time to have friends and enjoy family and homes to invite friends to and enough money to put both food on the table and buy the necessary medications? Why is inequality so bad and getting worse and worsening at ever increasing rates? Is it because those who experience such exclusion deserve it? Maybe it's because they're lazy, or stupid, or God forbid they made some mistake, unlike the power elite who don't make mistakes. No. It's because so much of the so-called wisdom of this age is bankrupt. It's because so much of our systems of value is worthless. It's because quote-unquote power so often means the successful abuse of others for one's own benefit. It's because the so-called powerful own the markets in which we must exist, control the governments that shape our social and economic lives, create the narratives by which we understand social reality, and do everything that can be done to maintain this status quo. In America, it's because of a half century of neoliberalist indoctrination and development. It's because in this world, humanity executed love incarnate. The gospel is God's invitation to a different way, the way of love, the way of actual wisdom, actual power, and systems of value that are actually worth everything. Please share your own insights and questions in the comments and let us know what you think of this reading. Remember that whoever you are and whatever you're facing, you are loved beyond imagination by the Lord of the universe. If you like this content, give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Check out the videos on screen and the references and resources in the description. Thanks for watching.